Hey everyone, I'm your host Anthony. We do content like this weekly, so hit the subscribe button and ring the bell to get notified. If you want more content like this, click the like button and please leave a comment. Thanks again for watching. So, hey everyone, and welcome to our live class. We're super excited to have you here today, and we're looking forward to a great presentation. My name is Anthony, and I will be your host. I'm joined on the line by Katie Chapman. She will be conducting the presentation today, and I'm going to pass it off to her in just a moment to kick off today's topic, which is a functional approach to bariatric surgery. Super interesting, exciting topic today. So I know this is going to be great. We're going to be learning a ton. Now, before we begin, I'd like to go over just a couple housekeeping items. Everyone is muted by default. And number two, if you have any questions during the course of this live class, please submit them into the chat panel. The questions will come to me as the host, and I'll be conducting a live question and answer with Katie Chapman at the end of today's presentation. And lastly, at the end of today's live class, Adrian Martinez, who is our head of practitioner partnerships, and Rupa Health is going to do a live demonstration for all of you. So for those of you who are new to Rupa Health, please feel free to stick around if you'd like to learn how we can help you optimize your practice further. And for those of you who already use us and are familiar, thank you so much. And if you need to get back to your practice or day at that point in time, feel free to hop off. So I'd like to now hand it off to Katie to begin the presentation today. Thanks so much, Anthony. Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to this exciting, I'm going to just use exciting still, exciting uh, talk about uh, a functional approach to bariatric surgery. A uh, little bit of background about me. I am a registered dietitian, and I have worked with people who are preparing or who have undergone bariatric surgery for the past 13 years. So I've seen lots of changes and um, developments in, in my time in that specialty area and um, started adding in some functional aspects probably within the past uh three years of my practice because of just a growing need, interest, and then also um, for people who are just years out postoperatively and you just start seeing things. So I wanted to take this opportunity today to just lay some foundation, one, and then also um, take a look at what is both in the literature and evidence, but also functionally, um, experience wise too, and maybe how, uh, potentially to think about your patient or your client who has had a previous bariatric surgery. So let's kind of dive in here a little bit today. I do want to over do an overview of bariatric surgery itself. Just really brief, just, uh, to determine the different types. Cause that might make a difference in how I'll think about a patient or a client, um, some signs, symptoms, causes of some of the things that are seen postoperatively, and even weight regain, and potentially um, what could be thought of is, is helping with further weight loss. And then looking at those functional lab results and nutrient supplementation treatment, and what I see uh, functional lab wise uh, with bariatric surgery. So let's dive in. And we'll start with just a quick overview. So first and foremost, uh, obesity is multifactorial. So I will admit that I am looking at just kind of a, a subsection of this, but there are so many factors when it comes to obesity and health um, and, and managing obesity. And so one way um, to do that, or one way of an approach is with bariatric surgery. And bariatric surgery does quite a few different things. There's some that are restrictive, there's some that are malabsorptive, there's some that are um, a combination of both of those. And there are certain qualifications from the National Institute of Health that I have on the screen here that, um, that kind of guides qualification for surgery. Um, and I just threw up an example of picture wise of a ruin wine gastric bypass that 
because that's probably the most common one that in uh, sleeve gastrectomy that are done um, currently. But there are a several bariatric surgeries that are in existence. And what I notice is that I have clients who have had surgery and had surgery many moons ago, and then now are like, hey, <laughs> help, I have this surgery, but all these other factors are going on. I might have weight regain. I might have gut health issues, um, just also even nutrient and absorption issues. And let's take a closer look at that. So types of surgery, I just wanted to break this down. So then that way we can also uh, determine how I would maybe think through some of these things. So we have a um, metabolic surgery, which is our surgeries that kind of um, change metabolism change, um, hormone regulation. So they change, um, insulin resistance, insulin regulation, and then also our hunger fullness sig signals. So ghrelin and leptin. And then finally those other digestive hormones as well. So a myriad of, uh, a myriad of different communication. So just think like GLP-1 and PYY and um, CCK. Those are all changed as well with those metabolic and malabsorptive surgeries. Um, might make a difference as I approach hormones with someone. And then we come into more restrictive or anatomical surgeries, um, which is our sleeve gastrectomy and adjustable gastric band. So um, sleeve gastrectomy, you do see some changes in, in insulin communication um, and lessen of insul lessening of insulin resistance. Um, but, but overall, that's considered much more of an anatomical surgery. And then we have just our endoscopic surgery. So they don't really change um, anything anatomically, but they might be a um, additive to the system and might also change, um, let's say gut microbiome or change how absorption happens. So some of that is an uh, example, like a gastric balloon or a space occupying device. Um, so a lot of, lot of nuances to bariatric surgery as a whole. So I just wanted to kind of go through each of those. So, so there's a, a, a more of a greater depth of knowledge that each of these exists because they will come up later. So let's talk what, what we maybe see, what happens with surgery and, and after surgery as a whole. So first I wanna talk micronutrients because that's probably the most, let's say common thing that's thought of with a bariatric surgery. So. For those of us that work in um, functional medicine or, or even just think in a functional um, medicine way, uh, we are really looking at that whole person and how micronutrients can affect several things, um, energy, fatigue, hair loss, um, mood, uh, menstruation, uh, et cetera. And so some of the things that I look at with micronutrient deficiencies, I'm going to think through, well, hmm, which surgery did they have? Are there anatomical changes? Do they absorb a little bit differently or because there's a um, change in uh, kind of how their system is routed? Am I missing opportunities for absorption? Is there potentially a change in acid or are they um, on like a proton pump inhibitor that would make me really kind of think through those micronutrients a little bit more. And there is definitely, definitely um, research and, and uh, micronutrient deficiencies are common after bariatric surgery. And usually people are put on a um, regimen post-surgery that they should be on for life. But if I'm thinking about this in a little bit different way, uh, do, does that need to be customized? And usually it does. So 
kind of quickly my, my most common ones that are looked at for micronutrient wise after surgery, um, some of those B vitamins, uh, calcium, vitamin D, uh, my fat soluble vitamins, uh, iron, and then sometimes zinc and copper and that, that connection um, are, are typically ones that are nutrients of note after a bariatric surgery or one that I'll kind of um, just, you know, make sure that I, I keep in mind to take a closer look at. There's some reasoning there of uh, why potentially something's depleted other than loss of like a primary um, absorptive site. However, um, I, again, there's always that customization with this. And I might want to take a closer look on a cellular level, which is where my functional testing will come in. So just to kind of drill this home, um, the micronutrients that are most prevalent of deficiency after surgery, um, I wanted to give at least some context of, from, from the literature of, of what's seen um, percentage-wise of deficiency after surgery. So um, quite a few lessons there and, and quite common. I can say that um, the micronutrients, they, they, from my many moons in this field, if I have someone who had surgery 20 to 25 years ago, uh, these weren't as uh, defined or weren't advised to be taken on a long-term basis or to be monitored on a long-term basis. And then if I have someone who had surgery a little bit more recently, then this is monitored a, a, a little bit more um, distinct, but not, not always. So I always kind of keep that, keep that in the back of my head. That's probably one of the first things that I look at. So we do have kind of typical after surgery recommendations. I wanted to have this for everyone to kind of keep in their back pocket. So they'll know, hey, this is what's usually told or prescribed um, within vitamins and minerals um, for your information. But again, I usually customize this as I dive in a little bit deeper and, and get to know my client better. So let's talk gut microbial health, um, just what we see, and then we'll circle back on testing here at the end. So I do see microbiome changes after surgery and, and some of the usual things that are seen, um, weight gain or weight regain, uh, upset stomach, bloating gas is, is a very typical one. And then also the changes in bowel movements, such as constipation and diarrhea. And so some of that has to do with anatomical changes, malabsorption, maybe acid production, um, or uh, nutrient intake. And so for a lot of people, um, before I even suspect microbiome uh, changes, I do want to ensure how are they eating? <laughs> are they getting in just my basics? Are they getting in vegetables? Are they getting in um, some great prebiotic fibers to uh, feed that commensal flora? And, and so I kind of... Um, even before I get into the weeds with this, even though it's, it's common, I, I want to build up that baseline because after surgery, some people are, are, are definitely told to pay attention to different things. So um, some people will be super protein heavy that they'll forget about vegetables. Some people will be on um, uh, a certain restrictive, um, protocol of their, um, choice or use. And so some of those basics that help support the microbiome are actually, um, not seen. So I start there first and then kind of go into my next of like what happens after surgery. So we do see that after surgery, we do see a change in gut microbiome. So there's some literature of um, that the changes are positive. There's a whole breadth of literature um, and some new studies coming out of Belgium that show very little change 
in um, gut microbiome to the positive, let's say, after surgery. And in addition to that, um, there, there's actually an increase in, in overgrowth after surgery as well. So let's talk about that a little bit more. So microbiome prior to surgery, what do we usually see? We do usually see an overall dysbiosis. So um, reduced bacterial diversity, increased firmicutes, decreased bacterioidetes, which increases that host efficiency at harvesting energy. So typically um, in increases that host um, holding on or, or having that extra caloric energy. And then potentially with how someone's eating, not supporting that microbiome as we would like to see it. So that's typically what's seen before surgery. I'll also um, mention too, uh, in preparation for surgery as well, um, H. pylori is, is a typical one that is checked prior to surgery and wants to be, um, most surgeons want that to be eradicated before surgery. So that's usually done um, through antibiotics. And I've had people who are um, who have taken like three rounds of antibiotics as they're preparing for surgery or, or to try to eradicate H. pylori and not have it kind of screen positive um, it, when that test comes back before surgery. So uh, that um, in itself also can alter this microbiome before even getting, getting into surgery itself. So after surgery, what, what is actually kind of seen or what changes are seen. So we do see a change in hormones with that gut brain axis and also signaling for insulin secretion. And that usually um, is, a, is a positive change. We absolutely, if it is a metabolic surgery, so let's say like a ruin Y or a biliopancreatic diversion or a SABI, um, those are kind of the top three that are done in that metabolic or, or that um, really um, re vast change in um, small intestines, then we'll see a change in surface area for absorption and in addition, um, reduced area for microbe and microbial health. Then we also have that double impact of maybe nutrient malabsorption, and then what's recommended after surgery. Um, and usually it's a pretty higher protein, uh, lower carbohydrate, um, not no carbohydrate, but lower carbohydrate um, dietary recommendations or nutrition recommendations um, along with some uh, vegetables in there for great fiber. However, not everyone um, follows that to a T. Uh, absolutely, there's the past effects of someone who uh, hasn't really changed their diet or um, usually uses mostly packaged foods. It might be a, um, let's say like protein heavy or protein supplement or et cetera, but that also will affect that, uh, that microbial health part after surgery. And then we also do definitely see that change in composition. So we'll see formicutes and methanogens decrease, um, but we'll also see an increase in those gamma proteobacterias. Um, this is kind of a little bit, let's say on the newer side um, with, with looking at what happens to uh, the gut composition after surgery. There's a, um, gosh, 2020, I, I want to say 2020 article that um, took a look at ruin wine gastric bypass and what is the gut microbiota changes after surgery. And they noted that within the first six months, there was actually not much of a, of a change in that gut microbiota in the positive side. So um, still, still was seeing that the firmicutes was pretty high, the 
aridities is pretty low. And both of those actually contribute to um, obesity. And so um, they, they just noted, again, I feel like this is such a the new and interesting area. They noted that something else needed to occur or happen to assist these changes or positive changes um, in composition to help reduce obesity and help to prevent weight regain. So there's a, definitely an opportunity to put this kind of angle and thinking in supporting someone after bariatric surgery in their gut microbial health um, and, and also in, in supporting them for continued weight loss and for continued weight maintenance. The other thing that I also think is interesting that scene, and, and again, I feel like this is such a new area. So <laughs> I will admit for, for all of my kind of years in the subject that the, um, that, uh, yeah, I mean, it's only been probably within the past oh, three to five years that this part has really been paid attention to and paid attention in a way that could assist someone in their bariatric surgery journey. So uh, most of the time, or usually it would just be like, here's surgery, here's what's going to happen. And then, okay, it's, it, it happens, it, it helps, it's a tool, it changes, um, hunger fullness levels and it changes insulin uh, resistance, but not all the pieces of health were really thought of in this way. So what I do think is interesting, and um, uh, I, I will say that from experience, I do see this commonly, that there is um, potential actually overgrowth found in uh, 15 to 40% of patients after surgery. So just, I think about it this way, or I explain this to, to my clients in this way, um, especially when you have a metabolic, so I see it more commonly in like a ruin Y or a biliopancreatic diversion than I will with like a sleeve gastrectomy or a um, adjustable gastric band is that when someone has that, that change or that rerouting of intestines, small intestines, uh, along with change in stomach area, it's kind of like you have this whole microbiotic system in there uh, that is a house. <laughs> we're picking up that house and we're shaking it and we're putting it back down. And because there's less surface area, because there is that, that change in that rerouting um, and especially ruin why we have a kind of a remnant stomach and then a part of a small intestines that isn't quite used in the same way, meaning that it helps to support enzymes, it helps to support um, bile, but it doesn't have uh, food going down in there. So we, we kind of lose or miss out on having fiber going through that section. And so uh, we will commonly see small intestinal bacterial overgrowth because of um, just that kind of rerouting part of it and having that really big shakeup oh, of our microbial health and then sitting it back, sitting it down for it just to kind of regrow. And there's usually not anything prophylactically or in preparation um, given for microbial health post-surgery. So just kind of some, some at least uh, little tidbits on how, how I look at this or, or what I see and how to explain uh, that for your clients as well. So let's talk sex hormone balance, what we see, surgery, post-surgery. And then I'll kind of go into like testing and, and, and what I look for, what I see, and, and just what I see in practice as well. So looking here at our kind of sex hormones and sex hormone balance. So um, a hormone balance. Yes, absolutely. So signs and symptoms, some basics here. So 
signs and symptoms, weight loss, weight gain, fatigue, muscle aches, weakness, mood swings. I mean, there's a myriad. I just put some of the more common things that I, at least for someone, um, even before surgery, but, but post-surgery, uh, see for people when, when they're like, Hey, this is going on. And this is different for, for, for me after surgery and, you know, again, causes. So causes are, are the same causes that could happen, uh, without the presence of a bariatric surgery. But again, I just think of it a little bit differently potentially in, um, how, how I'm approaching uh, sex hormone and, and sex hormone imbalance. So what do we see kind of pre post-surgery? So we do see obesity related gonad dysfunction. It's pretty common. Um, and so, uh, in, and I just gave some numbers here I, again, I always feel like some of this area and, and, and the presence of bariatric surgery is just not studied, um, enough. And, crossing my fingers that we get to have a deep dive into all of this over time. But what, what do we know at least for now? So uh, PCOS is present in about 36% of women who are pursuing bariatric surgery. So I say this pursuing bariatric surgery, not everyone pursues bariatric surgery. Um, the, the other kind of part of this too, is I, I feel like, um, you know, and it could just be my bias of seeing people, but I feel like this is a little bit low, um, of a percentage. I think the other part too, is PCOS is not always diagnosed. So, um, we could have, we could have that present in a higher percentage, um, of those pursuing bariatric surgery. And then we do see actually male obesity associated, um, secondary hypogonadism, and that's in about 64% of men pursuing bariatric surgery. So looking at some numbers or some figures after surgery, and this is typically um, measured within the first year after surgery, we um, will see PCOS resolution in about 96%. And then for um, male associated um, hypogonadism, 87% resolution. So I look at it as this, right? Complete resolution rarely occurs for like complete resolutions. Symptoms are, are greatly improved, but that's also within the first year. I know that bariatric surgery, yes, it happens, but, but in, in kind of happens and we have these great things usually within the first year, but then after that, Hmm, we still have life that goes on <laughs> and what, what do we see? Or, or what about those percentages of affected men or women who, um, who don't have complete resolution of, of symptoms? after surgery. So there's some opportunity to be able to help look at this in a, in a, a, in a larger way or on a larger scale. So I just to kind of break this down. What do we see within the first year? I do see change in hormones, change or restoration in some menstrual cycles, uh, lower androgens, uh, decrease in insulin resistance, decrease in inflammatory markers, um, little change in some of the other hormones that affect, um, cycles and then first year post-op very little information, but, but right. There is some kind of redevelopment or things that come back. So, right. What, what can we do or how can we really look at this to help our clients? So I want to go into, Let's take our functional part or piece of this um, to just take a look at what we have in our kind of tool belt <laughs> to really, really dive in a little bit deeper and just give, give people some sense of this. Um, I know that a, a lot of times um, someone will get a surgery 
um, let's say they have very little weight loss or um, they have slower weight loss after bariatric surgery, and then they have some, they start having some weight regain. A lot of times it's looked at as, huh, okay, maybe surgery isn't optimized. We might look at some of the other factors, endocrine factors, et cetera, um, toward, to, towards assisting with that surgery. But I also, you know, or, hey, is someone not kind of following directions or following what they should be doing? And so I like to take a look at, right, put my functional sense on here and go, let's look at this whole picture. We know that weight and weight loss is not in a vacuum. It is not just, this is how you eat. We're looking at inflammation. We're looking at hormones. We're looking at gut microbiome. We're looking at micronutrients. If we don't have micronutrients that are being actively used by the cells, then we're not going to get robust met metabolism um, or metabolic health to be able to break down and utilize energy in the body. So that's where that functional sense comes in. Um, and I'm also always, always going to mention to my clients, sleep and stress. The other parts of this, this factor, I feel like sometimes I'm, I may be preaching to the choir here, but, um, I, I, I just put my, my kind of thinking hat on this in a little bit different way. So what do, what are my kind of top three, my top three labs that I do? So I, I'm going to do one for micronutrients, I'm going to do one for gut health and I'm going to do one for hormones. That's my, my usual kind of sense of, of what I'm looking at or what I'm utilizing with my clients, um, post bariatric surgery. So let's talk micronutrients. Um, so I, I typically use SpectraCell and I, on the, on the kind of left side of the screen here, I did, um, just, just put a brief overview for those of you who are not familiar with SpectraCell. And so what I look at some important measures that I look at that I see really, really different after surgery, or that I'm trying to keep in the back of my head in terms of someone, um, surgery wise is I'm looking at B12 and, and folic acid, um, really all of my B vitamins, um, because that's going to relate to methylation, um, and hormone methylation. So I, I want to look at all those B vitamins, but I typically look at B12 and folic acid. Those are, those are ones that are, um, usually kind of off, let's say in this screening, I do look at vitamin D, uh, vitamin D hormone wise is related to so many different things. And especially I think of it in, um, insulin resistance and insulin function and being able to help with, uh, the vitamin D receptors, uh, for, for insulin, uh, metabolism and control. And so what we do see in the presence of obesity and even thinking obesity and after bariatric surgery is that we'll see with vitamin D it is, um, people are usually taking a high dose of vitamin D, but their serum levels can sometimes just still be low. And I'm wanting to look on a cellular level. Is it actually utilized or functioning and what, what will be my optimal, um, dosage for someone for vitamin D in the presence of bariatric surgery for that particular person. I also look at metabolites. Um, carnitine probably is the one that I look at the most, um, but I'm trying to see metabolic function. And then coenzyme Q10 is one that is uh, also that I think of in terms of heart health and function. And then also my glucose insulin interaction. So a couple of things that I at least kind of hone, hone in on, um, not that the other parts aren't, aren't equally as important, but this is what I typically see after bariatric surgery. So in that presence. 
So just a quick sample here of, of anyone that's not familiar with uh, spectra cells. So what, what I'm kind of looking at as far as vitamin, vitamins, minerals, but then also at the same time, um, those, those other uh, metabolites and those other uh, nutrients that I'm, I'm looking at in terms of screening. So I did want to say, what is, what is standard? Okay. So standard, there's usually a vitamin regimen that someone is given post-surgery. So part of that usual vitamin regimen is they might be on a bariatric formulated vitamin that is, has higher doses of the things that typically go low, which I went over at the beginning and put some of those numbers up. Um, and then usually a calcium, um, citrate separate. Uh, there's also people who are kind of like a non-bariatric formulated regimen. That's, I guess, my easiest way to describe um, the two, which they'll do maybe an over-the-counter multi and then have things separate. Um, so I've seen both ways. And then I've also seen, um, you know, I like none after surgery too. So um, I, first and foremost, I'm kind of going, hey, what are they on? How long have they been on those regimens? Um, has there been any times where they've been off those regimens? And do, do I need to look at kind of absorption or even um, format of that vitamin to be able to absorb a little bit better or be utilized better? So that's kind of where, one place where I've been, where I start. And then um, kind of, let's say again, standard. So are there any nutritional recommendations that they're following guidelines, uh, even as far as uh, eating? Are there certain recommendations? Are they utilizing whole foods or are they utilizing um, kind of maybe a packaged uh, product on a regular basis? Are there supplementation, uh, liquid protein supplements or anything else happening? And then are there certain specific foods or textures that they cannot tolerate, that they have a hard time with? So, um, I do think of that in the sense of, are there certain um, robust micronutrients that they're going to be missing because they have a hard time with certain foods or certain textures and they are having to um, kind of overly cook their food in order for that texture to be really, really soft. And would that make me think, gosh, are there micronutrients that are getting broken down that may not be as robust? for, for even use, um, by someone's body. So, and then I just, I put up the supplementation too. So sometimes it's bariatric formulated and sometimes it's, it's all separate. So just getting my, my baseline set on here. So what do I, what do I usually see interpretation or what do I, what do I look at with that spectra cell? So I do usually see in post-bariatric surgery, a couple of things. So I usually see lower B vitamins, lower metabolites, and lower magnesium. That's a pretty common thing that I see. Um, glucose and insulin interaction, depending on when the test is run. So I would say if it's within the first two years of bariatric surgery, I see an, a great improvement in that interaction. After that two years, I actually see that reduce. So um, I kind of keep that in mind and looking at, do, do I have a history on <laughs> my client with this test or am I looking at it as just mm, they're within their first two years and would I advise or would I want to see them yearly to run um, and, and take a look at the trend in this marker. And then there is always the, um, let's say like the vitamin A kind of um, question. That's, that's one of those vitamins that are typically seen as going low after surgery. However, I want to take a look at a like acid, um, see if that is a um, gut health issue for this because typically micronutrients are focused on after surgery. And so sometimes the nuances with this might be, oh gosh, they are taking a bariatric formulated vitamin in their vitamin A 
um, what they're taking orally is, is, is fine, is what we would think <laughs> that we would want someone to take. But is that oleic acid um, being able to metabolize and, and use that vitamin A that is going in orally? So I want to take a look at, hey, let's look at the acid part, but let's also look at the vitamin A and to see if that retinol is actually in range. So some other supplementation that I think of, I do think of a multivitamin or potentially a, a bariatric formulated multivitamin or um, some of my other uh, kind of multivitamins that's going to be a higher dose in B vitamins, um, higher dose in magnesium. But I also um, look at like, what do I need to do separate? So some of those supplementation that I might need to do separate or think about separately will be potentially inositol for that um, glucose insulin interaction, uh, iron separate, a uh, carnitine or a B complex. And so oftentimes I have people who I'll do spectra cell on and then, um, uh, that I'll see trending. So, um, I always like a really nice baseline if I can get it <laughs> post, uh, post surgery within that first two years and then run this yearly on them. So I can, so we can constantly or consistently, um, tweak what, what we're doing for them supplementation wise to really optimize how their micronutrients are being used within the cell of the body versus, um, potentially just, a just a kind of usual, um, test to say, are you higher? Are you low? And then gut microbial health. I kind of look at this in the way of, um, taking a look at, uh, I use the GI map. And so again, left-hand side, I kind of put some information for those of you not familiar, but what I really, and this is probably, um, I use this probably the most with my clients is I'm, I'm really looking at what their gut environment is doing. Um, because usually that gut microbiota of what we see before surgery, um, is obesity promoting. And so after surgery, we usually need assistance to be able to, um, change around that gut microbiota to be obesity reducing, but then also at the same time too, um, not having any overgrowth or other, um, intestinal health issues that would just is a quality of life part would make someone not tolerate food, feel uncomfortable, bloated, cramping, all of, all of the above. So what do I kind of look for? I definitely look at H. pylori. That's a really common one before surgery. And as I said before, a lot of times people will be put on antibiotics to be able to eradicate that prior to surgery. If I am so lucky to get someone to do this before surgery, which is not usually as common as I would like it, um, then I, I, and I have time, I, I like to treat or, or look at H. pylori um, in a, uh, by utilizing supplementation, which is a bit of a slower time frame, but uh, it, it ends up being a better or a more helpful uh, gut environment uh, than, po than having the antibiotic protocol. Um, I look at dysbiosis and I also look at secretory IgA. So a couple of things to kind of look at here in presence of bariatric surgery and, and what do I see? So just a quick sample of what this looks like and, and, and what the GI map takes a look at. And I look and I put the opportunistic bacteria up here because I, I do see um, usually for people after surgery, I do see a bit of overgrowth in that opportunistic bacteria. So what is the standard information on gut health after surgery? Um, I really will be honest that I usually only see fiber. <laughs> I'll see people say like, oh, okay, you need more fiber. Maybe add fiber to like a, like a Benefiber or something like that to your um, protein supplement. And sometimes I'll see probiotics. But for the most part, I am not seeing all of the other factors that go into a microbiome. 
and for gut health. So um, that's kind of the standard, let's say, information. And we know we can geek out of here a little bit more. Um, and so, uh, you know, nutrition wise, I'll see, as I said, fiber, fiber supplement, sometimes I'll see fermented food, um, stress, activity, sleep. I sometimes will see that. Um, and then, and then supplementation wise, mm, some prebiotics, most of the time I'm seeing a probiotic and a capsule form and usually very little direction on specifics. And every once in a while I get someone on a Saccharomyces boulardii. That's pretty standard. So knowing gut health and gut health information, what do we have at our fingertips? And so what I usually see post-bariatric surgery is I usually see H. pylori present in some sense. I'll usually see some sort of gut dysbiosis with opportunistic bacteria overgrown. And then I'll see a low secretory IgA, which makes me a little bit nervous because of that immune barrier function and leading to um, more inflammation. And so with that inflammation, then we have weight weight gain, we have all other effects of our body and our body system. So it makes me a little bit nervous there, um, especially with that one. So recommendations, I usually do a mastic gum and DGL for H. pylori. Um, I sometimes will do a prebiotic or a probiotic um, kind of for, for long-term health. Uh, depending on, on what's going on with my client um, for overgrowth, um, depending on what it is, but uh, some common ones that I'll use is a, like a sweet warm, warm wood or a grapefruit seed extract. I definitely will use an immunoglobulin for that secretory IgA. Um, and then for, for kind of that long-term um, use of Saccharomyces boulardii to help with gut lining integrity. And then uh, absolutely stress, physical activity, sleep, and looking into all of those factors. And as we know, um, all of this is usually a, a kind of like a domino effect. It leans on each other. So, um, you know, the gut health part might then change the micronutrient part and also change the sex hormone part of this. So let's talk sex hormones real quick. So I utilize Dutch testing with a lot of my clients. And so again, left-hand side, just some information about that. And then what do I, you know, usually see, or my kind of interpretation of, of results here, what I usually see is I usually see um, HPA access um, difficulty. So um, a lot of that uh, hypothalamus pituitary adrenal gland access being off um, that will have to support. Um, and then also at the same time to some of those androgens and estrogen. That's, that's what usually comes up at least um, for, for what I've seen for a lot of clients after surgery. And obviously, as I spoke about before, we still have also um, PCOS that might still be present, um, maybe endometriosis. So I think this is, again, that, that other area that has a little bit of evidence to it, but hopefully to see more over time. So just a quick kind of sample put up on here. What I'm oftentimes mainly looking at is I'm looking at in this summary, um, in my quick overview, I, I really do want to see about that um, kind of the the daily free cortisol pattern and if that um, sleep or stress pattern is going to be affected. Um, and then also a, a quick look at uh, their sex hormones in light of any anything that they had going on before surgery or what could develop after surgery. So I did put in some vitamin D parts in here because I wanted to just keep in mind too, since I spoke about vitamin D before and was talking about, Hey, what do vitamin D is so important? What do we see <laughs> within the cell? Um, when I'm looking at sex, spectra cell and what, what, do, what do people usually take? And so vitamin D is probably one of the ones that I pay my closest attention to. And also just knowing what it affects hormonally too. So I didn't, um, I wanted to kind of put this part in there just to continue that conversation. Standard information of hormone balance and what they say for after surgery is 
nutrition, I'll be honest, there's sometimes no nutrition information at all when talking about hormones and surgery. Usually they're thought of a really separate kind of thing or separate um, part of the picture. Uh, I look at whole foods, uh, healthy fats, um, sleep, stress, uh, just, I want to get a really good basic of are also, are their, their calories supporting them and themselves to, um, supporting hormone development, growth and, um, communication and then supplementation, um, typically standard is they'll think vitamin D and omega-3 fatty acids, and then usually some sort of birth control support um, in, in speaking about um, people who have menstruation. So if there's PCOS and endometriosis present, then really looking at like oftentimes they're put on some sort of birth control to um, that's kind of that standard information. So what do I look at in terms of bariatric surgery and what do I usually see? Um, one, I love to deep dive with people um, just on this part of knowing there could be incredible improvements after bariatric surgery, but things are still off. And for those who menstruate, I'll, I'll usually see that there's a big change in hormones for people in the first three to six months after surgery. So they'll be like, oh my gosh, my cycle's completely off. And that's pretty common. And then it gets into its own rhythm. But then what is that new rhythm? Um, are there improvements? Are there less, let's say like heavy flow or cramping or anything like that? So what do I see? Interpretation or at least what, what's common. So I typically see with androgens, there's that five alpha pathway that's preferred. I do see PCOS still present for people. I oftentimes see an, an adrenal dysfunction. Um, so I'm, I'm then focusing in on that, like sleep and that stress and that, that kind of regulation and, and, and approaching um, food in life. Um, and then some insulin dysregulation, especially get further out from surgery, um, since that's already a um, common thread for their body to know. So it's easy to kind of pop back into there. So some, some recommendations that I look at depending on what's going on. So definitely I look at vitamin um, D3, omega-3 fatty acids, those B-complex vitamins, because I want to help for estrogen methylation. Uh, maybe I'll use a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor um, or Vitex uh, for PCOS, adrenal support for sure. And then I do look at that sleep and that stress response. So there are some typical things that kind of come up with, with, um, with this. So, you know, quick kind of review here, just know that obesity is multifactorial. So I really look at like my different types of bariatric surgery and, and what they are and what they do. Um, and, and do they change around that small intestines or do they not? And maybe what am I thinking about, um, gut health, hormonal health, or even, uh, micronutrient health wise for obesity and supporting or not supporting it. Um, and then, you know, that functional testing and that approach with clients can be really, really helpful for long-term care. Um, cause it's, it's usually like in a bubble surgery happens, Hey, we have weight loss. Then we start seeing some weight regain or some, some quote unquote issues come back. And I'm trying to look at like, okay, how can we really support in that presence of surgery? And what are some of the other areas of opportunity that we really get to look into that we can maximize along this whole journey? So I know we're going to go into questions. I hope I, uh, I know we have some time left to do that, Anthony. So um, thank you so much. And then I'm going to put my information up here just in case anyone needs to get in touch with me. Amazing. Thank you so much, Katie. That was great. I know that was, that was a lot of information. You did a, a really nice job here today. I really like how you dove deep into this topic of the post-operative bariatric surgery patient as it relates to micronutrients and hormones and gut health and all of the testing, and which a lot of this is commonly missed. So thank you for really going over this really important information. I know that these types of patients are, are prevalent in our population, so it's good to know this, this information. 
So we do have a handful of questions here and we, we have plenty of time. So I'm going to just dive right in. And okay. the first question is in working with someone that had a previous bariatric surgery, what are some things that you keep in mind that would be approached or even thought of differently? So a little bit of a unique question. Yeah, yeah. So I think where I kind of, um, if I'm thinking bariatric surgery, like a couple of things that I keep in mind, or I would want to look into what, how did they eat or what, what did they eat before surgery? Like how did that environment look like for them? Did that change after surgery? So that kind of one part of this picture, what type of surgery did they have? So if they had something that's metabolic, um, that changes or reroutes their small intestines, I'm going to definitely think honestly, gut health would be like my first and foremost part that I think about, um, more than anything else, to be honest with you, um, versus if they had one that is, uh, anatomically changed or like an insert kind of, um, uh, surgery. So I probably approach it just in that different way of really looking at that, like, Hey, let's take a step back. And it's not just, you know, one or another, um, like let's look at the actual surgery that you had and then what changes have been made over time. And then probably last, how long ago was that surgery? Was it 20 years ago or was it a year ago? Yeah. It makes a lot of sense knowing what type of surgery in the first place is going to lead you down that pathway. So, and there's obviously numerous as you went over today. So thank you for that. Uh, question number two is which issue and testing procedure post-surgery do you use or say see most often in your practice? Um, GI map, honestly, gut health. Um, it's such a clue or uh, it's such a kind of it's the gateway <laughs> in, in the sense of uh, how someone maybe utilizes food doesn't utilize food and then also I think because people get more in tune with their digestion after surgery then the things bubble up of like oh I kind of was this way before surgery and now it's even worse after surgery and and it's like, oh, we get this great new opportunity to really maximize that. Makes sense. Makes sense. So number three question, uh, Katie, is what common complications post-surgery can also cause these issues, I think, related to um, that, that was a follow-up question, I think, there. So Yeah. So um, I think that um, common complications. So, I, you know, definitely with what I see, and I'm going to speak gut health because I do see that as like such a common one. So before surgery, I mentioned H. pylori is really, really present on a lot of people. And so they'll test, they'll do antibiotics. So you start having this like, you know, probably gut health stuff that has been happening forever. And then you throw some other themes in there. <laughs> and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, and then you also have a change in anatomy or a change in small intestines. And then it's just like, whew, that all sits down. So that's what I see the most, like, let's say common kind of type thing with that is, is honestly the H. pylori part. And then just, I dissect that in a way of what, what, what does that do as far as a disruptor? And then going forward, how can I bring everything back in balance? Makes sense. Yeah, it's a it's a tough bug. And for those of you who are are on today, we had a, actually a, a really fantastic live yes. class just a few weeks ago on H. pylori as a yeah. master class. So feel free to go back and watch that one if you're getting patients with H. pylori, which as as you're saying is common, especially after mm -hmm. after surgery and and yeah. that structural change specifically. So. Super helpful. Thank you, Katie. Okay, moving on to question number four, uh, relating to this root cause perspective, can you further discuss the association with poor gut health and micronutrient deficiencies and hormone imbalances, kind of the interplay between these three that you kind of covered today? Yeah, so, um, you know, what I commonly see is that people are on, especially if they've had surgery in the past 
uh, five years. They are on some sort of vitamin regimen. So I don't see my micronutrients come up like as strongly to play, but like, let's look at the gut health part of it. They're on some sort of micronutrient supplementation. And then is that being broken down? Is that being <laughs> utilized? Like the absorption, do we have a gut permeability that like really impedes how those cells are able to take up those micronutrients? And then on the flip side, I look at the gut health with hormone imbalances. Um, constipation's really, really common after bariatric surgery uh, for numerous reasons. And so um, that, that kind of last part of hormone methylation or that, that last part of hormone own, um, breakdown is through the gut. So, um, I'm kind of looking at it of like, okay, is that gut causing a traffic jam with those hormones? So all, all interrelated. <laughs> definitely, definitely interrelated and definitely makes sense. Thanks for putting those pieces together a little bit further. Yeah. All right. And last question for you today, Katie, again, fantastic job. Uh, for anybody interested again, here's, uh, Ms. Chapman's all her information okay. on that screen there. So you can find more about Katie. Um, so last question here, Katie, um, kind of a comparison question. What differences do you see in patient outcomes using a more functional approach as you've kind of gone over today for two bariatric surgery versus a more traditional or conventional approach? The two biggest things that I see is one quality of life. So I actually see people's quality of life so much better. They don't have like bloating, constipation. We work on getting those hormones in line. I mean, mood's better. So quality of life, big part. And then I also see less um, weight regain. And I'll say this, that after surgery, there's a typical amount of kind of like, you know, we get to our lowest weight and then people kind of shift a little bit about 10 to 25 pounds. Okay. That's, that's common over five years. But um, I, I definitely see that we have less potential to go back and start having a lot of that regain if we look at all the other factors that are part of the obesity picture, which is in a functional sense. It's not just like, hey, you know, don't do this and do this. So, yeah. hundred percent, hundred percent. We always want to obviously treat the patient as you know, uh... so. Yeah, totally, totally agree. Uh, Katie, again, thank you so much for answering the questions. What a great presentation today on such a really interesting topic, much needed for you know, all the functional medicine practitioners out there. And I know we weren't able to get to all of the questions today. So if you have any additional, please feel free to reach us, uh, reach out to us after this live class. So again, thank you, Katie, for, for your time and presentation today. Thank you so much. And I hope you guys have a great rest of your uh, day and please reach out if you need anything and I'll hand it over to you guys so you can show all the great Rupa Health stuff. Amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah. So again, shout out to Katie Chapman, amazing presentation there. You can find her at all of her social. And uh, we now have Adrian Martinez, head of practitioner partnerships at Rupa Health. He's going to put on a live demo for you right now. So again, feel free to stick around and Adrian, floor is yours. Awesome. Thank you, Dr. Anthony, Katie. Amazing to see you again. Uh, glad we were able to get this all put together. Uh, an awesome presentation. So, um, you know, for those of y'all sticking around, thanks for, for joining me this afternoon. As Dr. Anthony mentioned, my name is Adrian Martinez. I am the head of practitioner partnerships here at Rupa Health. Um, really what that means is I am on the ground floor on a daily basis, speaking to our practitioners, educating, answering questions, and really being that point person when it comes to Rupa Health to ensure that everyone who is interested in joining Rupa Health is uh, off to a great start and you know, all those questions that you have are answered. So that's really what I'm here today to do is give a quick presentation as to who we are, what we do, and why do we do what we do here at Rupa Health. So if you're joining us <clears throat> currently, you likely created a Rupa Health account um, to join into this call. So you're probably curious, and some of you are probably curious as to who we are and what we do. So Rupa Health is a platform that was created with the vision in mind to make root cause medicine accessible to the entire world. As I'm sure you're aware, if you are running tests currently, there's a lot of pain points associated with these tests from both the practitioner side as well as the patient side. So that's what Rupa Health was created to do, was really to help alleviate a lot of those pain points that can be oftentimes associated with these tests. Things such as 
having to have separate accounts with each and every one of your labs in order to order these tests. That can be a lot to manage, not only creating those accounts and submitting all the paperwork to do so, but of course, having to receive all those results from different places, right? It can be a lot to manage from that sense. On the patient side of things, things such as uh, pricing transparency, the ability to offer multiple payment solutions to your patients to get access to these tests, holding the patient's hand through the instructions and test taking phase, specimen issues, right? Again, all these things would generally have to be done very manually on your end, managed by either yourself if you're a solo practitioner or if you're lucky enough to have a physician's assistant or staff manage it, things that would take up hours upon hours on that end. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen here and walk you through exactly what Rupa Health has done to help alleviate these different pain points. So on Rupa Health, what you're looking at right now is the Rupa Health dashboard. The first thing that we've done here and just for quick agenda of what we're gonna to go today is I'm gonna cover the three core primary, I guess, value propositions of Rupa Health. From there, I'll walk you through what these uh, additional features here on the left-hand side. But from an overview, Rupa Health has brought on 20 plus labs into one place, allowing you as a practitioner or your staff to be able to order from all these labs that you're seeing up here on the top left without having to go to each individual portal to do so. So you'll notice labs on here, Doctors Data, Genova Diagnostic Solutions, uh, ZRT, Spectracell. I know Katie mentioned them during her presentation as well. So right now, all you'll need is one account with Rupa Health. And again, you're gonna be able to order from all these labs in one place. So what does that look like to place an order? Well, let me show you how quickly and easy it is to. So to start an order on Rupa Health, you'll just go up here to the top right where it says start an order. We'll just need three bits of basic information to complete the order. We need the patient's first name, last name, and email address. From there, we collect everything else directly from the patient, and that ensures the accuracy of the information in case the patient's information has changed, as well as ensures just a more streamlined uh, experience for you and your staff, right? You're not going to have to go in and type in all the data. It's going to be collected directly from the patient. So what you're seeing here is the patient's, or excuse me, is the order screen. So up at the top here, you'll notice that we have bundles. So we can create uh, custom bundles here on Rupa Health. Uh, we have a bundle library that Dr. Anthony helped put together, uh, but you're able to hop in and create a custom bundle, a set of tests, a set of blood panels, a combo of blood panels and tests from any one of our partnered labs. And that way it's just one click. And all of those tests that you're looking to add are added into your cart over here on the right-hand side without having to search through that entire catalog that I just showed you, which is over 2000 tests, right? So making things as easy as possible to order a bundle of tests right off the bat. And again, you can customize those from any one of the labs that we work with. Below that, you'll see that we have a favorites list. So a favorites test being an individual test that you're commonly ordering, you're able to add a heart next to that test. And again, that way the test is gonna be showing up at the top. So it's one click, that test is added into your cart. Again, the idea here is to save time. So you can add that GI straight away into your uh, lab test or into your cart. Uh, you can add that organic acids in there, um, spectra cell micronutrients test, all available at your fingertips, again, from uh, any one of our 20 plus labs in one place, just within a matter of seconds. So with that, once those tests are added into your cart, it's a simple screening set of patient. Um, and, and that's how quick and easy it really is to send a, a test out to the patient. Now, I'll show you some details that you can do to customize this order, but if nothing else, as simple as clicking send a patient. But let's hop into the top right here and show you what some of those details and additions might be. So first thing would be, we can actually schedule tests on Rupa Health. So for example, if you are seeing a patient and let's say that you want to test and retest this patient out six months in advance, traditionally what that would require is you having to write it somewhere into a, a calendar and going in and manually reordering that test for the patient, six months down the line directly from the lab. Through Rupa Health, you can go ahead and schedule that test out six months down the line. It'll automate that process so you can essentially set it and forget it, right? If there's an add-on test available for the test, it'll be highlighted here with this button being available. So let's say I wanna add Zonulin to my GI map. I go ahead and click that button there. It'll bring up the details of this test. So things such as the sample type, the shipping and turnaround times, a copy of the patient instructions, sample reports, any biomarkers will be highlighted. Uh, but of course that Zonulin is available straight away here as well. 
additionally, let's chat about how the patient pays for the tests, right? Or rather just how the, the tests are paid for. We offer two solutions. So you can actually have us invoice the patient directly for the tests, um, or you have the option of paying for the tests yourself and managing billing outside of Rupa Health. So you have both the options of practitioner pay as well as the patient pay. I would say the heavy majority of our practitioners and our users prefer to have the patient invoice directly, but of course it's up to you and you have the option on a uh, test or rather on an order by order basis. Um, you can add notes for the patient, so for example, if the patient is taking a specific supplement regimen that you want them to continue to take, you have the option of adding any notes. This goes directly to them. Notes for us as well, as well as you can add ICD-10 codes. So if the patient does want to submit a super bill to insurance for reimbursement after the fact, you have the option of adding ICD-10 codes directly within here. We have a full catalog built into Rupa Health, so you don't have to know the ICD-10 code off the top of your head. You simply need to know a keyword and it'll bring up all of the options available for you. And you'll be able to add that on there. And we'll go ahead and submit and send a uh, template to the patient with instructions showing them how to create that super bill, submit that to their insurance. So those are some of the customizable options that you have within the order, uh, order flow here at Rupa Health. So what I'll show you next is very important. Of course, how we generate our revenue, what costs look like, all that, right? So with Rupa Health, the way that our pricing works is we've negotiated wholesale practitioner rates with all of our labs. What that means is the same prices that you would get going directly and having an account with any one of our labs are the same prices that we have here at Rupa Health. So you'll notice that there's two costs up here at the top for this organic acids test. What that's showing you is the $399 cost on the left-hand side that's grayed out and crossed out. That's what would be the patient price. So if the patient were to be referred directly to Great Plains, for example, they would be charged $400 for this test. Through Rupa Health, they're being charged $249. So huge cost savings there and huge potential cost savings for your patients available there. The way that we generate our revenue is there's just a flat 7% processing and ordering fee on each order. Now that's paid for by whoever's paying for the tests. What I mean by that is if you're having us invoice the patient directly for the cost of the tests, then the patient will be the one absorbing that $37.50 in this case, right? That 7% processing and ordering fee. Um, the only time that you would pay for that 7% would be, of course, if you decide to pay for the order yourself. Rupa Health is a free platform to sign up for. As you saw when you created your account, we didn't ask for a credit card. You didn't sign a contract or anything of that nature. It's a free platform to use and leverage to your business. This 7% processing and ordering fee is the only charge associated with Rupa Health. So if you're having us invoice the patient and manage billing directly with the patient, Rupa Health is a free platform for you. So potentially saving you and your team hours and hours on managing all your lab work. So what I just showed you is exactly how we're going to go ahead and place an order on Rupa Health. What I'll get to very quickly next is actually how we're tracking these orders. So within this main screen is where you're going to track all your orders here on Rupa Health. You can filter by name. You can filter by status of that order. So we'll continually update the status of your orders once you've placed that order with the patient. You'll notice I can click into an order at any time. This is one of my in-progress orders and I can get an indication as to things such as when the sample arrived at the lab, when I can expect those results come in. So I'll be able to plan more accordingly with my patients. Again, all these different tests and all these different labs information in one place without having to go to each individual portal to get communications from those labs as to when I can expect them in. So again, efficiency, right? Once those results are in, you're able to click into your order and be able to view things such as the results, you can send them to the patient. I can schedule a clinical consultation with that lab should I need some assistance interpreting the results. And then of course, I'll have access to a requisition as well. So a couple of things to call out here. The results that you're receiving are the same exact results that you would receive from the labs. We're not interpreting, we're not making our own versions of these results. These are the same exact results that you would be receiving should you go directly to the lab with the results themselves. You have full control of how the patient receives those. We will never send the results directly to the patient without your consent. So you have full control as to when the patient receives those results from Rupa. So just a couple quick calls here. Once you've had the option of, or opportunity rather, to view those results, you can change the status as marked as review. So you can, again, know when and what status each test is at. So again, just to recap, what we've covered is how you're placing that order and then how you're tracking those orders. What I'm gonna show you next is really the third value proposition. In my opinion, probably the most valuable 
proposition that Rupa has to offer. And, and what that is is the patient experience. So as soon as you place that order on Rupa Health, we can effectively take it from there. A lot of the pain points associated with this testing comes from the hours spent with the patients, right? A lot of the hand-holding associated with the patients, a lot of the questions that can come in and be filled, the specimen issues, coordinating phlebotomy, especially if you're working in a telehealth type environment, right? So as soon as you place that order on Rupa Health, you want to take it from there and manage the entire patient experience end to end. So what does that look like? Once you place that order through our platform, your patient will get a notification from us. The kids will be shipped out within 24 hours of payment. So one another thing to call out here is, we do not ship the kits out until payment is made on the kits. Okay, I know that might be different than some of the other labs. We'll send over FAQs, instructions, videos on how to take the tests, and we'll send it directly to the patient. We'll help coordinate the phlebotomy. We'll walk them through how to fill out the requisition forms. Um, from there, we'll check in and follow up with the patient. Again, automating that process, making it more streamlined for you and the team. From there, you're notified as the results come in. So here is an example of what I'm showing you now of the communications that are sent to the patient. And this is what the communications will look like should the patient be the one paying. Hi, Joshua, Dr. Jordan has ordered these tests for you. We'll introduce who we are, and then we'll highlight the different payment options that we accept. So notice here at the bottom, the different payment options that we accept. So beyond just cash and credit, we can accept uh, HSA, we can accept FSA, and we can even set up a three-month interest-free payment plan with the patient. Now, if you recall earlier, I mentioned that one of the big goals of Rupa Health is to bring root cause medicine to the world. This is one of the ways that we're lowering the barrier of entry to get access to these oftentimes very expensive tests, is providing additional payment solutions to the patients that are paying for these tests. On the right-hand side, you'll notice uh, the information that we're collecting. So we'll collect all the necessary information to complete your the the building and highlight the test that was ordered for them and make it very transparent as to what the costs are going to be associated to this order. Now, should you decide to pay for the order and have the patient bill outside of Rupa, this is what the communications will look like. Um, now, I do want to call out very quickly that whether you're paying for the order or the patient's paying for the order, there's no differentiation in terms of the patient experience. We're still going to manage the entire patient experience end to end. Of course, the big difference here is that the patient is not going to be paying for the test to Rupa. So with that, we're not going to show the patient the cost of the tests. So you'll notice here, we're essentially going to be collecting shipping information and demographic information, but we're not going to show the cost of the test, but we will still show what test was ordered for them so they'll be aware as to what to expect. Down below, you'll see the notification that we'll send to the patient once the order has been shipped out. And then from there, we'll go ahead and send over a personalized instruction page, which highlights FAQs, instructions. A lot of our tests have video instructions now, which are super beneficial. Uh, we'll walk them through how to fill out the requisition form. And then if there is a blood draw required, we can customize those instructions based on your recommendation. If you are lucky enough to you know, have a phlebotomist in your office or know of one locally that you wanna send a patient to, we can collect that information, send that to the patient. Otherwise, we'll go ahead and send over the options based off of the uh, lab that they are working with. However, should the patient have any questions, uh, whether it's how to take the tests or, hey, I uh, am looking and interested in additional options for my phlebotomy, let's say I wanna use a mobile phlebotomist, they'll reach out to us and our team and we'll go ahead and facilitate answering those questions on your behalf. Of course, if it's anything medical related, we'll send them back your way. You'll see an example of one of our instructions on the right-hand side here with the Dutch Complete. This is highlighting again, how we'll make sure uh, uh, the phlebotomy coordination is taken care of, how to fill out the requisition form, um, and then we'll follow up with the patient. All of this is to say, what Rupa Health really has done is we've created a technology to provide a service that's come to be expected in 2021, um, not only just for your patients, but also for you and your team, right? Uh, we want to get rid of a lot of the cumbersome work that can be involved with these tests um, and bring it into a digital world, making your life much easier. And then, of course, you're notified via email as those results come in and you're able to view those results all within Rupa Health. So to recap, once again, the three primary 
I would say value propositions for Rupa Health would be streamlining the ability for you to track, manage, order all of your lab work in one place, as well as have one single solution for your patient experience. So no longer is your staff going to have to spend hours a week uh, you know, on any specific patient on answering their questions according to phlebotomy. Let us manage all of that heavy lifting and take it off your shoulders, bring it onto ours. So those are the three primary, uh, I would say value propositions for Rupa Health. Now with that, I wanna just jump back to the main dashboard here and talk about Rupa Health more as a platform than just a place to order your lab work because it really is much more than that. You know, you're all joining us today on a Rupa University class um, that has been live. And of course, you know, Katie came on and gave an amazing talk, but this isn't just a one-off. Um, we're building a platform here that we want our practitioners and our users to come on and join uh, and to continue to grow, to continue to learn. So you'll notice that you can have access to an entire class library of previously recorded classes that we've done, all available here. You have access to see what we have up and coming. Um, within the support center, you can get an indication of uh, you know, how to actually use the site. We have a magazine, so we're consistently putting content out on how to continue to grow, how to learn, um, you know, important, uh, important topics within the functional medicine landscape. So again, all this to say that Rupa Health is a platform where you're going to be able to join, not only place and order your lab work and, and, and make your life easier at your clinic, but also continue to learn, to grow, and have access to a lot of really cool content uh, that we're putting out here, including a podcast that Dr. Anthony hosts. So, you know, with that, uh, my name is Adrian Martinez. Should you have any questions or want to get in touch, feel free to reach out to me. Um, there's my email. It's very straightforward. Adrian at rupahealth.com. There's my phone number. Feel free to, you know, text, email, whatever is easiest for you. I'm always available to hop on a call and talk about um, Rupa Health and how we can fit into your clinic. Um, now, keep in mind that Rupa Health is not only just for, you know, small solo practitioners or clinics. Um, we can work with really clinics of any size with our platform. So, you know, with that, hope you're all having a great start to your year and I'm looking forward to hearing from some of you.